So, uh, good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, lecture in the software technology uh, class. Today we're going to talk about software architecture. And what is software architecture? Well, it's, uh, it's about software design. And, and you remember this slide by now. We, we, we've been up a couple of times. We talked about it. And, and we're dealing with complex systems that are invisible. We're a team working on this. Uh, and given the variations in, in uh, user requirements, uh, technical requirements, technology we use for, for, uh, for the implementation, etc., it's always the first time. So, so uh, yeah, working here is, is uh, challenging. Uh, so what we need to do here is, is to, 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 to solve some, some, some uh, problems. First is, is to align work, that the team works in, a, in one direction. And, and uh, it's also the case, given the, the complexity here, that we cannot work together on everything. So, so we need to, to uh, somehow decompose this, uh, this system in a way that we can work in parallel, decentralized, uh, on different parts. Uh, and then, at the end of the day, these parts will, will fit together. Uh, so so uh, we end up with a coherent system where similar prim uh, principles or the same principles, of course, apply. Uh, and that the pieces, well, they conform to, 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 uh, to the, the uh, agreements we, 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 uh, we did before we started to, to work in parallel. So, Software architecture is trying to address this. And, and it's a lot about the, the early design decisions we make, that we take early in the project in order to uh, make sure that we align the work. We work towards a, a common goal, independently if we work in parallel teams on parts of the system so that we, at the end of the product, have parts that will conform, that will fit together, and make up a coherent system where the same principles apply throughout the system. So uh, design is about forming a plan. Forming a plan in our minds. So, so we try to, to, to uh, envision some kind of road or path towards the, the, the possible solution to, to a problem. And, and the intention for this, this plan is, of course, that it should be possible to execute it. So if we follow this plan, we will eventually end up where we want to. And the reason why we want to have this plan is, of course, that if we don't have a plan, uh, the guarantees that we will actually end up where we want to end up are not there. So the design is about, well, uh, making the invisible system visible in the sense that we can see that, OK, if we follow this plan, if we do this and then that and then that and then that and so on, we will end up somewhere almost, well, we cannot be 100% sure, but close to where we should end up with this project. So design, coming up with a plan. What do you do when you plan? Well, you make decisions. First we do this, then we do that, and so on. And these decisions are extremely important because they will decide where we end up with our projects. And if you look at the software design activities, they are about the same things. It's about making design decisions. And what we have up here 
let's call it a decision tree. A decision tree? Well, what you see here, it's, it's, it's not really a tree, it's actually two nodes up here, which is like the, the, the top level nodes in this decision tree. And what this says is that, well, some of the decisions will impact more or less the entire system, whereas others are much more local. So some, these two guys up here, will impact the other decisions. And what most people talk about in this, this context is something called the design space. So you know when, before you start your design, you have a goal somewhere over there, but then there is an, an indefinite number of, of possibilities to get from here to there. That's your design space. But as soon as you start making decisions, you will restrict the design space. You will narrow it down. And that's good because then you can focus on details but it's also bad to some extent because if you make a bad decision early on, your design space will not support or will not make it possible for you to design a system, design the system you want to design or have to design. But some decisions are global, affecting, if not the entire system, a large part of the system. Could you imagine a, a decision like that? What, what type of design decision could impact the entire system? Yep. Should we uh, make it uh, independent of operating system? Yeah, that, that's, that could be, I would say, yeah, that would impact a large part of the, the, the system because that will force us to select technology that supports platform independence or uh, cross-platform development or something like that. So that's a, that's a very good example of an early decision because imagine the situation if you don't make this kind of decision early on. Say that you guys, you start working for weeks, months, and then at the end of the project, someone comes up with this brilliant idea that we should make this independent of operating system. What would happen? Disaster, because suddenly we make a global decision late in the process. And since our global decisions will impact many other decisions we made during the course of the project, we have a lot of things that we need to redo, redesign, reconsider. But then we have the other type of decisions, local ones. They're not that tough, really. And they are not that tough to change because there are not too many other design decisions depending upon these. So local decisions are e much easier uh, to, to manage compared to the global ones. So uh, global decisions impact the local ones and we must decide on the global first. So what's the challenge here? Well. When you make your decisions, you need to have some kind of system representation. A representation that you can use to, to reason about design alternatives, the options at hand, uh, show it to your, your teammates, discuss the options and agree upon some strategy. 
So at this point, we don't have code. We don't have any idea about objects. We have some vague understanding of the, the requirements, some understanding of the functionality that should go into the system, and possibly also the, the quality requirements. So this is what we know, but we don't, we don't have a system yet. So we must start somewhere. And this somewhere is, well, something that we can use to reason about the global decisions. And this thing is the software architecture. So architecture, this, this of course, comes from, uh, well, building architecture, the same idea. Uh, think of a, think of a uh, well, building a house. When you build a house, you must have some, some, some idea about what type of house you want to build. Is it a, uh, an apartment building? Or is it a, a well, a family house? Is it a, an office? Well, the different types of systems here will have different types of architecture. So a, an apartment building looks different to, to, to your, your, your family house, OK? But you need some kind of rough plan early on in your project. And, and if you look at, at, at uh, If you look at the, the, the rough plan for, for a building project, they typically start with some, some sketches. We intend to build these houses. And it's, it's, it's sketches that, that are easy to, to, to show to, to people, people in the, in the, in the uh, city building to, to have them agree to that this is a good product, etc. But it's, it's not about the details. It's just showing something that, that we can reason about. And it can be, well, should it really be eight stories high? Uh, you know, here uh, we can only allow six stories or something like that. And uh, if you plan to build a, a, a villa in this uh, um, area, you must uh, remember that uh, it cannot be more than 200 square meters or something like that. So, so there are way, uh, reasons why we need these early designs, early design decisions, so that we can reason about the, the, the properties of our systems before we actually go into the detailed design. So, so we need some kind of system decomposition. System decomposition for software, where we can start to reason about the system properties early on. Because we have to make sure, now we know the requirements. And, and what we have to, to, to make sure is that, OK, we can divide it up into parts. And answer a question like, do we have all the parts? Do we have all the, the responsibilities we need to, to achieve the, the functionality the users are looking for with the quality they are looking for. And when we have answered that, well, will the parts fit together? Remember this, this conformance, that if we divide something up into to subsystems and have them separately developed, well, we must make sure that when we put them back together, they will work together. So this is what we work with software architecture decomposing the system. But then we have the other part of this. And these are the system concerns. The, the system concern. You can hear from, well, system concern that these are decisions that are concerns for the system. They are not local. They are global. And, well, 
functionality is, of course, a concern for the entire system. But what you will see is, is qualities. They must be dealt with early on in the project. And this is where the main focus, together with the functionality, of course, is actually uh, the, the main focus for, for, for the decisions you make uh, on the architectural level. Because you want to deal with not just the functionality in a structured way, you also want to, well, reason about what is performance for the system, how can we achieve, how can we guarantee performance given the quality requirements we have for performance, how can we guarantee that uh, in, in our system, how can we guarantee security in our system. These are things, because security is a concern for the entire system not just a single part of it. Performance is a concern for the system, not just a single part of it. So, uh, software architecture gives us the possibility to, to apply engineering practices, you know, consider alternatives, evaluate, pick the ones that, that best matches your uh, requirements early on without having software. By doing this decomposition, applying the engineering uh, practices, well, we will have parts that conforms, parts that we can put back into a system because there is integrity. So, principal design decisions including the, the top level, first level decomposition, where you identify the principal uh, subsystems, the key abstractions of your application. Then, there are different ways of structuring these key abstractions. You can, you can organize them in different ways to get different properties. We will look at an example of that soon. And then we have these mechanisms that, well, makes the components or the parts uh, interact in different way, ways to, to, to uh, realize these system-wide concerns. So, strategical decisions, global decisions. Important or essential in relation to plan of action. Highly important uh, to an intended objective. So remember the design to devise a plan. We want to end up somewhere. The strategic decisions or architecture decisions are highly important because if we don't get those right, we cannot finish where we want to finish. So, let's start with decomposition, because uh, a system consists of subsystems that contain subsystems which can further be decomposed. Well, you can always decompose a system into smaller parts, more or less. There is some lowest level, but, but it will take you some time to get down there. So why do you do this? Why do you decompose? Well, the, co the complete system, the full system, is so complex so that, well, it's impossible for, for a single human being to grasp it. Okay, so let's divide it up into parts. Now you can focus on a part. Can you understand that part? Maybe. But it could also be that it's still too complex, so you decompose it again. Then you look at the subsystems of that subsystem. Can you understand the parts of that subsystem? And at some point, you have decomposed the system to a level where you can actually, well, understand the part and you can devise a plan, come up with a design that if you follow that design, implement, uh, you can implement a solution 
something that uh, is part of the solution to the, to the complete problem. So that means that problem solving with software is just about, well, finding the best pieces, identifying the best subsystems, implement them, and then join them back together. Or there's one thing that we can never forget here. When you decompose, you must make some decisions before you decompose. And this is not a decision tree here, but you can still, this is a, a, a decomposition. But what you can say is that if you make a decision to divide this system up into these two subsystems, the decisions that concerns both these subsystems must be made before the decomposition. You follow that? So a decision that concerns this and that must be made before people start working on this and that in parallel. If we don't do that, if we don't make the decision before the decomposition, joining them together will not be that easy. At least there are no guarantees that the pieces will fit. But if we make the decisions before the decomposition, well, at least well, there will never be a th such a thing as a guarantee, but at least there is, if people stick to the agreements, to the de decisions, conform to the, to the design decisions, well, it's more likely that the pieces will fit. So what we're talking about here is something called integrity, system integrity that making decisions before decomposition is a way to achieve system integrity. So if you look at integrity in, 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 a, in a dictionary, firm adherence to code of especially moral or artistic values, ah, maybe you can uh, translate that into software. Think of your subsystems if these adhere to, to the code, to the decision we made before we decompose them, well, it's more likely that they can coexist when we put them back together. The second one here, here is, is a little bit more to it. The quality or state of being complete or undivided. Okay, so we're looking for integrity, which is a property of completeness or, or, well, two things that are not divided. But we divide them. We decompose. But we're looking for integrity that they should appear as being undivided. And this is extremely important because if you don't get this right, you will have a nightmare when you start putting pieces back together. So, integrity means that the critical characteristics for a system, you must deal with them first. You must resolve them first. It's impossible to, to come up with a cohesive system bottom up. You must control it when you decompose. You cannot make it work when you put the pieces back together. The, the end product will be of such low, such low quality if you do that, that it will be, well, if you ever get it working, it will be a definite candidate for a complete makeover for our next release. So uh, 
System integrity means that, well, you make the decisions before you decompose. And when you make the decisions, well, you will see that, that several of the decisions we make depends on other decisions. And sometimes there are decisions that go in completely different directions. I will give you an example. Think of security and performance. One way to, to secure information in your system is to have encrypted data. Okay? Encryption. Encryption affects what? Performance. Another example is usability and security. Say that you have user authentication. That affects usability. It's not annoying to log on once, but if you have to authenticate yourself all the time, it affects the usability of the product. So what you can see here is that, well, a decision you make about some concern will affect some other concern. So it's not just about, well, let's make a couple of decisions and we're all happy. No, no. You need to trade one con concern for another or many concerns for another. So it's not as straightforward as you have, what you have seen so far. It's much more complex than it might appear at first glance. At the end of the day, we have to come up with a system that is good enough. So it can be that we sacrifice performance for some security, but we want to aim for good enough security and good enough performance. So let's have a look at this example. Users that share documents. What is most important in here? What are the critical concerns? Well, let's go to the requirements. Well, the functional requirement that is the most important is that we want to share files. OK? So it's not that we want to have um, some avatars for users or that we want to be able to change our color uh, scheme or something like that. The, the critical concern here is that we want to share files. Okay? So, before we decompose, before we start to identify subsystems in here, we must agree upon how we share files. You see? If we don't agree upon that, and people start working on the subsystems, there are no guarantees that we will actually be able to share any files when we put the pieces back together. Obvious one. What else do we have? Well, quality. You remember the FERPS plus requirements like performance, security, reliability. Just briefly talked about performance and security. If we decompose, we have to agree upon how to, to uh, uh, realize security in the system. Because security will be a concern for several of the subsystems. It will be for the client side that the user is here used to access to whatever we have in the middle here. And in the middle, there must be s some authentication mechanism, some user management, etc. So an example of decisions that must be made before we decompose. Here are some decision examples. Well, 
if you want to figure out first, well, how, how, how should we share files? There will be a couple of options for doing that. So is there a reference architecture? What can we look at uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, on the market? Do we have any uh, similar systems? How are they doing this? Well, you need some, some decision about, well, how to, to uh, uh, realize this core functionality, sharing files, before you start your, your first level decomposition. And then there is, well, a long list of questions like, how will the system address concerns X, X and Y? Performance security, usability, reliability, all the sub items in, in, in these, these quality classes. Decisions you make before you start to decompose. What's important here is that this is not just about design, it's also about managing risk. Remember this uh, uh, discussion we had in one of the first lectures where in the beginning of a project, your, your aim is to reduce the risks. And then, at the end of the product, you start adding value. And what we can say here with architectural decisions is the following. They target risks. For instance, sharing files. If we don't address this critical concern first, well, if we wait with start to wait with the design for sharing files, well, we actually increase the risk that we at the end of the product will not have something that supports the core functionality. Big risk. It's also performance, security. These are also critical concerns because show me that user who will be happy with a system where they can share files, but it takes 30 minutes. Or a user that is happy with, okay, you can share files, but there is absolutely no security here. So we reduce the risks, and we, when we decided on, well, the decomposition and how to realize performance, security, et cetera, and the core functionality, then we can start to add the values. Then we can start to add the avatar support for our users, the color coding for documents, et cetera. But that's something we wait with until the later parts of the project. So. Uh, architectural design decisions, well, as any other design activity, it's an intellectual creative process. And these are, are kind of challenging because if you think of, of a process, well, Creativity, where does that come from? Well, often someone has experience with some system, have seen, has seen a system or, or something like that. So creativity comes, it's not the case that, that people sit and invent things over and over again or all the time. We actually re-implement systems over and over again. But the, crea uh, the creative process here is a bit challenging because there are really no guidance. There is not a recipe that you can bring out of your pocket and, and follow that recipe and it will work for any system. Because the core functionality, the critical concerns, are all different if you consider one system or another. 
So, so there must be some other approach that is more generic, that applies to any type of system. And as I said, the concerns that are uh, important are typically domain related. And the decisions you make are often based on your own personal experience or your teammates' experiences. So if you look at, 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 at this, it's, it's a, there is no clear process, uh, little or no guidance for which decisions to make, a lot of experience involved, domain knowledge involved. What's important here is, is not just that you document your decisions, but you must also document why you made a decision, the rationale. So why? Well, if you make a decision and you just document the decision, you forget the entire process, all the activities that, that made you make that decision. But since these decisions that we're talking about here, the architecture uh, decisions, are important for an entire system, what can happen if you, if you, if you consider a, a maintenance perspective? where the system has been out, been used for some time, and now someone comes back and say, hey, we really would like to see this change. And you can say, okay, in order to change this, we have to change this decision. Well, if you don't have the rationale, if you don't have the motivation for a decision, well, you have to backtrack and try to figure out, okay, why did we decide on this trade-off between security and performance, for instance? Or why did we decide on this decomposition and not that one? So, not just the end result, it's also, it's as important to, to, to document the entire process. When we talk about design, well, as you've seen, it's on different levels. And of course, as we decompose, well, the levels, the de level of detail will be uh, much richer as we go down this decision tree. And beside the locality, it's, well, the generality is also there. So typically at up here, you set, the, you set the rules, you constrain what people can do on the lower levels. So just to exemplify this, uh, divide and conquer. This classical problem solving approach, well, you make, based on the problem, you start to decompose the problem into sub-problems, or we can call them subsystems here. And then we repeat this for our subsystems that, well, eventually we will have lots of them. But at some point, the, the, the locality changes. So the global impact is not really there anymore. And then we start talking about detailed design. Then it's when you guys start thinking in terms of, of objects or uh, user-defined types like classes. And then you start to make decisions about the implementation. And now we just keep our fingers crossed that we have integrity. So that when we start putting the pieces back together, they will work together. So uh, 
it's important here to, to remember that, that these decisions you make up here will constrain what you can do on the lower levels. If you make that decision we talked about in the beginning, platform independence, well, that is something that will affect what you can do down here and how you do it down here. But it's also something that affects this level, the detail design level, what you do and how you do it. So uh, it's not critical really, but, but it's when you make the decisions, it's important that you are able to filter out what is global, what is architectural, so that you don't end up in endless discussions on, on, on making too many detailed design decisions too early. And, and this is something that, that it comes from experience, but as, as I said before, there is no recipe, there is no rule of thumb that will guarantee that you always make the right decisions, not forgetting any. There is no such recipe. And it is difficult to say when something uh, that is a global decision becomes local, etc. So, so the only way here is to learn from your own mistakes and from your own, well, experiences. That's a better way to say it. So you know after a couple of projects that this works. So then why not do it the same way next time? Here are some examples of, of system-wide decisions. Uh, implementation technology. Is that a design decision? Yeah, it's a design constraint. So if you decide that we go for uh, we go for Java programming language, okay. Now you don't have all the options at hand anymore. Because if you say that we will implement everything in Java, well, you have to look for frameworks platforms that support Java. If you go for JavaScript, well, that rules out the frameworks, the platforms without support for JavaScript. And when you design your system, you design for these frameworks or for a specific platform. So you can see that that decision, the implementation technology, will affect the design decisions you make later in the process. And then, well, principles for quality concerns. Well, security here is an, as an example. This opens a, a, a can of worms. How do you do user authentication? How do you do session management? How do you do user management? How do you register new users? How do you deregister users? And what's important to remember is that for this security here, not all aspects, just because it's concerned with security, not all aspects are system-wide, global, but some. Session management, yes, that's probably something that is a concern for most, well, well, most parts of the system. But authentication, authentication, well, it's part of the session management, but if you, if you consider that, okay, here is where I log on to the system, it's just a function, not necessarily a concern for the entire system. Okay, so uh, time for a break. And after the break, I will explain this guy to you. Okay, so let's take 10 minutes. So welcome back. Uh, 
So what you see up on this slide is, is uh, standard, ISO 42010. And, and remember before the break we were talking about, well, the difficulty of, of uh, well, making the right decisions. First, well, finding out which decisions must be made and, and, and so on. And then to document the, the uh, decisions. So, so this standard targets exactly uh, that. It targets architectural uh, description. And description including the rationale. But the core of, of, of this, this uh, standard is uh, the uh, focus on three entities, the stakeholder. And the stakeholder is someone that has a concern in uh, the, uh, the system. So the stakeholder, well, if you take the system where we share files as uh, an example, well, the user is an obvious stakeholder here. And, and the user stakeholder, well, is concerned with the functionality, is concerned with the performance, is concerned with security, etc. So this is a little bit similar to, to the approach we saw when we modeled with use cases, that we look for uh, actors. But be aware that actors and stakeholders are not the same. Uh, because we have other stakeholders that are n definitely not actors on the system. Here it can be management in the company that uh, uh, develops the software, it can be uh, the guys responsible for the purchasing decision in, in the, the uh, uh, organization that uh, purchases uh, our system. So, so you have many more stakeholders here than, than you, what you have actors in the use case model. Uh, so, stakeholders and concerns, and here's just a list of, of, of well, what it is and, and, and so on. But just to, to give you an example of, of concerns, this is, this is a, a list of concerns from the standard. And it's a long list, but it's not a complete list. So, so what you see here are examples of decisions you must make, architectural decisions, yes, but not for all systems. So what you can see here is that, well, how do you document decisions not just regarding functionality, but also system purpose, openness, deadlock, subsystem integration. How do you document this? Well, the only thing for sure here is that you cannot document it all at once. So, Besides the stakeholder and the concern, there is a third concept, the view. So there will be a functionality view that describes the functionality concern for whatever stakeholders interested in the system functionality. There will be a performance view that describes how the system deals with performance for the stakeholders interested in this. So, so what you see here is a, is, a, is a system that is flexible with respect to, to the system you're currently working with. Because reliability is not a concern for all systems. For instance, deadlock is not for all systems. But let's come back to the well, this trinity here, stakeholder concern and view, and, 
and, and, and look at the, the concerns. And what you can see here is, is that functionality, information assurance, deadlock, business goals and strategies, they seem to be all over the place, high and low. So, what is this then? We have architecture here that talks about functionality, that talks about business goals and strategies, that talks about deadlock. We're talking about, before the break, global impact. And, okay, for sure, business goals and strategies have global impact. Functionality will also have it if you consider a single application. But what's, what's important here is, is really that architecture is not something that sits, well, in isolation. It's isolated from the environment. And just because we have a system here, architecture is affected by decisions made before we design this system, and it will, as I said before, have an effect, have an impact on the detailed design decisions and implementation decisions we make later. So, so what you have is, is a system and software architecture. So what's interesting here is that it doesn't matter if it's on the organizational level, on a software level, or the implementation level. The problems are similar. Principles are similar, and the solutions are similar. So, if you look at the organizational level, the organization has some functionality, some functions, some business functions, for instance. We must allocate responsibilities for these functions on different units in our organization. Similar problem as we see for, for, for a software system. On the implementation level, well, here we have procedures, functions, objects, well, whatever we choose to call them. And these are small subsystems that we give responsibility for, for well, do something. So it's a system. That's what unifies implementation, software, an organization. It's a system. So the organization is a collectivity with a relatively identifiable boundary. Some hierarchy, some uh, hierarchy that engages in activities that are usually s related to a set of goals. It's a system. So, decisions a company makes regarding, well, its bit business strategy, for instance. That decision will, of course, impact your decisions when you design an architecture. So this is the connection I want to make, that, that Architecture is, is, well, influenced by the organizational architecture and influences the implementation architecture. Let's put that into one picture. Up here, we have the business goals. And, well, let's talk about the university. The goals for the university is to, to, to pro provide education to students, for instance, 
uh, to do some uh, some research down here and 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 work together with uh, local industry to well in, in in outreach projects. So so we have some 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 business goals and. These business goals translates into different services, business services, a study program that we offer, a, a set of classes that we offer that uh, students may uh, apply for, and then we have some admissions procedure, and we have a registration procedure, and we have the execution of the, the, the class in terms of lectures, assignments, etc. And then we have some grading and grades registered in some system. And you guys can go and get a transcript that you can show to future employee, uh, employers to, to, well, I actually passed this class. So what have I been talking about here? Well, business functions like applications, the admissions procedure, well, they sit up here. But they map down to organizational units at the university. We have the admissions office. We have the faculty of technology. We have the departments. And the business functions offered to the environment, well, are managed by the organizational units down here. Okay, so the university has made decisions about these two levels. And now we come to the interesting part because at this level we have something called applications and information. Applications and information. Well, in support of these functions up here, applications, admissions, uh, course management, streaming of lectures? Well, we have applications and information. So, just to, to show you how a decision up here influence what we do down here, well, just think about this lecture. This lecture is streamed live, it's recorded, okay? So, what we decided up here was to stream and record lectures. So we should have a function here so that anyone can attend this lecture when it's streamed live, but also after the fact, as a recording. That's a business function up here. For that, we made some organizational changes. So we have a, a guy that produces the, uh, the streaming and the recording and so on. But then we have applications. We were looking for uh, applications to support the business function up here. And of course, what we, the decisions we made up here will constrain which applications we use down here. Then we have the infrastructure, that's the network, that's the, the uh, basic uh, uh, back office support with email, stuff like that. But what's important here is that decisions about the architecture, decisions up here about the business function actually mitigates coordination risks that we will have s different types of software down here that don't work together in a way that we can f meet or fulfill the business function up here. So it's not just about the software in the middle. Software exists in an environment within a context and these decisions will also impact. So now back to the example. So 
how should we decompose our system where we share files? Well, identify subsystems and assign responsibilities to the subsystems. Then identify the interfaces. Because when we define the interfaces, well, we actually know that, well, as long as we don't change the interface, most of the things that happens on the inside will not be interesting to the outside. That's a design principle, abstraction and encapsulation. We will talk more about that on uh, Thursday. But then we have the quality. So we have to think about how to do authentication, how to do performance, and so on for a system where we share files. And these decisions must be made so that we end up with system integrity. So when we do this, well, we have the architectural reasoning where we consider the different alternatives, compare them, and choose to pick the one that best matches our constraints, our requirements. Because we want to end up in a situation where we, well, our, our, the outcome of our decision is predictive. Because we want to know that at the end of the day, we end up over there and not there or there. So for the functionality, where can we start? Well. Our use cases, the functional specification of the requirements that we talked about last week. That's a good starting point. And we can use them to, to identify subsystems. And then make sure that we allocate responsibilities to our subsystems in a way that we can implement the behavior we specified in our use cases. So we can verify that we have the responsibilities we need. Quality. Well, quality is a bit more challenging because it's cross-cutting. Well, performance, it was difficult to just say, OK, let's have a fast subsystem here, and we will get performance. Or let's have a secure subsystem over here, and we get security. That's not the way it works. So we need a different approach there. So there are two approaches. One that focuses on how you organize, how you structure your subsystems, and one on, on functionality, mechanisms that you introduce to your architecture. So either the structure or with behavior, behavior that is used to, to realize, realize the quality, like authentication session management, etc. What's important here to remember is, is that the structure, how you structure your, your software, how you structure your architecture, will to a large extent, to a large degree, decide how easy or how difficult it will be to achieve the different qualities you have. So the decision you make early in the process can make it easier for you to achieve a certain quality like security compared to if you make another decision. And here is where you have this engineering principles, where you look at the options and you pick the one that you're looking for, that, that best matches your, your requirements. And here's an example. Again, we have the uh, sharing of files. So sharing of files, well, a very straightforward first level decomposition is into a client component. The client component is responsible for end user interaction, where end users can view and possibly upload files that they want to share. 
OK. And then we have the big monster in the middle. And this monster is a server that serves all the clients with functionality for sharing files. So most likely what we will end up with are files stored here in this centralized storage. OK? So now think about this structure here enabling certain qualities, making it more easy to, to realize qualities. One example, scalability. You know that as the number of users go up, can the system still deliver? Is this a performance-related property? Does the system scale? If we go from 100 to 10,000 users, will the system still give the performance we're looking for, the uh, low latencies we're asking for, the, the throughputs, etc.? Well, with this approach, because we have this guy in the middle here that serves all clients, I would say that no, with this structure, it will be more difficult to, to, to end up with a system that scales. You see? Something else. Well, reliability, which is a property that tells us if the system will be able to deliver its functionality to its end, end users. I would also say that this will make it more challenging to, to, to come up with a reliable system because we have this guy in the middle and if that guy in the middle is down, it's down. So is all bad with client servers? No, of course not. Uh, security. I would say that achieving security here, data integrity, uh, authentication, etc., well, that's not easy, but it's easier if you pick a client server structure. Because you can manage most of it here centralized, and that's good. So do we have any options here? Of course we have. If we want to share files, what type of structure, what type of architectures do most file sharing applications you use and you know of have? Well, it's not a single server in the middle. It looks something different. OK, so, so think of a peer-to-peer -peer network. The difference between the client server is, and, and this is an oversimplification, but in principle, you combine a client, a server, and a storage together. So each and every one of these here has a client part, has a server subsystem, and a storage subsystem. And then we can have, well, units that are just servers uh, storage, but, but, well, it depends on, 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 on the, the approach you, you choose. But keep it simple and, and think of this as a, well, straightforward peer-to-peer -peer where your clients can also be servers and, and store information. So what do we gain here? What do we gain from this? Well, scalability goes up. This is a much more scalable architecture because we have in the peer-to-peer -peer architecture mechanisms for adding new servers. It's like part of, part of the game here. Adding more, when you add a client, you get more server capacity, you get more storage capacity. Scalability goes up. Reliability. 
easier to achieve with an architecture structure like this. So if we replicate data on multiple servers here, it doesn't matter if a server is down, we can find the information somewhere else. Okay, and of course, since this is an example, security goes down. Because I would say that it's more challenging to implement security in this decentralized system compared to the centralized system for when you got when you had client-server. And I can just argue for it. Uh, it's, it will not be possible for me to come up with any evidence. But if you add a new machine here, well, it's easy to get scalable. Uh, it scales and it's more reliable because you add uh, resources to the system. However, well, how do you authentic? Uh, who? How, how do you know that this client is allowed to join the peer-to-peer -peer network? How do you? Who is managing this? Are all parties in the network responsible, or is it a single one? There are, of course, different strategies for that too, but. I, my, my message here is just that it's, it's a little bit more challenging to make this system secure compared to the other because it's more open. So, besides the, the, the different structures, the, the different patterns, you've seen examples of two patterns now, client-server and peer-to-peer. -peer. Besides this, we had the other one, which was the adding extra behavior to your system just to make them um, more secure, make them more performant or whatever. And <coughs> for software architecture, they, they refer to these as, as tactics or architectural strategies. So, so it's really about adding functionality only concerned with the quality. One example, performance. Say now that you, you selected this client-server uh, approach because, well, you thought we can deal with the reliability, we can deal with the performance in a different way. Client-server is still more straightforward, easier, we don't need all the uh, bells and whistles we would get from a peer-to-peer -peer network. So we picked client-server. And now you face a problem with scalability, now you face the problem of reliability. How do you do that? Well, load balancing. Load balancing means that you add extra resources to your system. So the server component, the server subsystem, you can actually add additional servers to your systems when needed. For that, you need some behavior, of course. And that behavior is a load balancer. And the load balancer detects when the load is closing in on too high for one server, say, and it adds another server. Besides that, the load balancer must also make sure that we have some kind of proxy that directs the traffic to the different, well, now two servers, so that we balance the load on these two servers. Extra behavior. And this is not some behavior you will get from the end user. This is behavior that you add as a software designer. Another example, reliability. If you look at uh, reliability, it's concerned with uh, the availability up here. And one of the basic principles behind making a system more reliable 
is to make sure that it's available, that it's actually up and ready to serve. Okay, so, so what can affect if a system is up and ready to serve or not? Well, faults. If a system, if we have a fault in our software, this fault may re result in a failure, and a failure may result in the system being down. And if the system is not, if, it's, if the system is down, it's not available, and that will affect the reliability of the system. So, what we can do is that we can increase the reliability through increasing the availability with techniques to recover from faults. And how do you do that? Well, you have to add extra behavior. Okay, so to finish this off, I uh, just want to show you an example. And, and I put the problem description on one slide. I don't expect you guys to, to be able to read it now, but it's, it's about a rental system. Uh, a company that where you can go and you can you can rent stuff you can well everything from tables and chairs to jackhammers and and, and tools and well, other tools and so on but and you can also make reservations for for these items and you can well it's a complex system that is uh, geographically distributed consists of different servers different clients etc so what, of type of, what type of decisions must be made on the architectural level for, for, for JETS rental then? Well, the functional decomposition. There are functions, and now we're talking about, from a business perspective, this, the owner, JED, is interested in having support for his business functions rent items, make reservation for items, and so on and so forth. So, so we must decompose this system into a set of subsystems and then allocate responsibilities to the subsystems in a way that we can actually provide for these business functions, support these business functions. However, JET is not interested in, in having an open system in the sense that anyone at any time can access the, the system, manipulate data, etc. Because, well, there must be some information or uh, information security in the system. So, not anyone, there should be some, some, some users with access control to the information. Information must be stored, so there should be some persistency. But when it comes to distribution, well, should it be local uh, storage of data or should it be centralized? Well, how should you sort out the persistency in your system, data persistency? What should we deploy for? Should it be uh, terminals, fixed, well, desktop computers? Should it be uh, server, dedicated servers? Should it be for the cloud? What should it, well, that's a decision you must make early on. What is the robustness of, system, of, of a system? Uh, can we guarantee that, that if a terminal goes down, the operations will, 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 will still be up, or JED is not interested in a system that is 100% dependent on, on, on uh, the software here. It should be ways around to make it work anyway. So, uh, what you do here is, well, you start with your so-called first level decomposition. And remember that this is the very first architectural decisions you make. 
So they are abstract. They are not specific at all. It's just to get something on the table so that you guys and the team can start to reason about it, okay? So you do, do the top level decomposition, get your first level decomposition. And here we have three principal subsystems, a user client, business logic, and some persistency. What we should do next is to define the interfaces because we want to have one team working on the persistency component or subsystem, someone working on the user clients, and someone working on the business logic. If they can work on it separately, from a product management perspective, we're far much better off. Because now we can control the teams and not the entire project. But we also have concerns here that we should not forget about. Well, distribution, authentication, robustness, etc. So the first level decomposition should be based on the functional requirements. And this is the, a robustness diagram, and, and we will talk more about this, this uh, uh, next time. But, but this is, in principle, just showing how a certain uh, use case is implemented in terms of objects that exchange messages. So we have some, some objects that represents a register user form up here. These objects somehow interacts with objects that is concerned or controlling that process. And then we have an entity object here representing the information uh, that should be, I should say user, not item. I forget to change that every time. I think it's the fifth time I make a note of it. I'm getting old. <laughs> so, but what you see here is that, okay, here, here is the, the, the functionality, and we can actually decompose it into, into responsibilities for, for individual objects. Okay? Not more than that. It's just like a decomposition. What can we do with this one? Well, you can actually say that the make reservation objects should be in the user client. No one disagrees? No. The check items, the create reservation, the check rentals, these objects goes into the business logic. So you can see that the robustness diagram give us, gives us some objects, and we can allocate these objects as responsibilities to our subsystems. OK? And for the persistency, well, we have the item here. We have a reservation, and we have a rental agreement. So now we can say that the guys responsible for the business logic here these guys must provide behavior so that this control process here, check items or create a reservation or check rentals, is met. The persistency guys must make sure that we are able to store and retrieve and query for items, for reservations, for rentals. So now we have the responsibilities here in terms of, of, of functional responsibilities. But we haven't really decided on how this user client here will communicate with the business logic, and the business logic will communicate with the persistency, and vice versa. The interfaces. So. 
for the user client, what's important there? It's not just how the user client will communicate with the business logic. It's also that these are boundary classes, so classes, uh, boundary objects, objects that will communicate with end user. So, so there is more to it. But for the user client, let's say that, okay, this is an HTML5 using this framework here. Okay. You see, an architectural decision. Now these guys can go out and they can come up with the make reservation boundary objects using this technology. However, they must know one more thing, and that's the interface towards the business logic. So what we call the API, if you go to your, your assignments, the API that the client uses to access the server. This interface, if you know that, you know how to code the user client because you know the tools you have over on the business logic side. For the business logic guys, well, they have an interface that they must provide here. So they, their responsibility is to implement the API the API for these system behaviors, system functions. But in order to do that, the business logic guys must communicate with the persistency layer. So we must think about this guy. What is the API that the business logic guys will use in their implementation? So we need to decide on that. But before we can do that, we need to figure out the persistency layer. What type of technologies do we use for persistency? Database manager, framework, etc. Well, there are many things that must be decided upon before we can, well, branch out and start doing things in parallel. So, functional decomposition, and then you can start talking about, well, what about persistency? What about authentication? What about performance? Another thing here is, okay, here we have one, two, three subsystem, user client, business logic, and persistency. But we haven't really decided yet upon how these guys will deploy, be deployed and on, on, on uh, uh, well, type of uh, computational resources we have at hand. But the, uh, Start here from a use case to a top level decomposition. You see what you do? You actually take the problem. You decompose the problem into responsibilities for these different objects. Then you will take each object and package it into a subsystem. And then you define the interfaces, and now the guys can start providing the interfaces. Because the interface is like a contract. So now you can start to design. How do I implement the objects with this particular behavior? Well, make a reservation. Which objects? Well, what is needed here? I need to... Uh, some authentication that someone has logged on to the system before they can make a reservation. I need some control objects that controls the interaction between the user client and whatever goes on here and the persistency over at this end. So you start to, to solve the problem. But it's on a level that it's, it's like really far from the implementation still. But you can use this to start making the decisions about, well, persistency, authentication, etc. And this was what we were looking for. 
So next thing is, of course, to, to, to start, well, identifying your subsystems and, and looking at the implementation technology and, well, you have an application server where you will deploy your, your business logic uh, and so on. You will have some Hibernate components uh, interacting with your database manager. Architectural decisions. Decisions you must make before you branch out because they will, the Hibernate here will force you to design your API in a certain way. The choice of your choice of application server here will also constrain how you can design the API for the use of clients. Decisions you must make early. So at the end of the day, this will actually be something like, well, someone pushes the add, add button somewhere, and there is a handler in, in well in this example, it's a Java uh, handler and an object is created, and this object is then transformed into different representations, JSON or whatever, and through the RESTful client, all the way through the application server, through the servlets, to the database. But this is an example of a decision that you must make before you can start to consider how this should be implemented in detail. Okay, so now we spent one lecture trying to figure out what software architecture was all about. We do this because we want to reason about system properties, early design decisions that cross cuts the entire system before we decompose it into subsystems. There was no recipe for doing this. We had to keep in mind that we had stakeholders, concerns, and different views to explain and to capture all the decisions and the rationales. Okay, so today it was about high-level decisions. Next time, we focus more on low-level, detailed design decisions. Okay, thank you.